I discovered this video clip from Amber O'Hearn, and I admit she is not a medical doctor. She is a computer scientist, and however, she is a mother who raised children, and she wrote widely on ketone bodies and ketosis, and looked at the literature, and I want to give the evidence from the lecture, which I thought it was a really good lecture, and there's one slide in particular which I copied, and I think that's important. And it just confirms everything I said in the previous, uh, previous uh, testimony. Do you want to play that video? No, I'm, no, it's too long. It's 30 minutes, and I extracted the eight slides that I thought were relevant. So here's a slide of uh, meat efficiency. And so if you need 18 milligrams of iron a day, you'd have to eat at least eight times more spinach than cooked liver etc. And the iron is also more difficult to absorb. So the ideal food for getting your iron from for a, a neonate is bovine liver or beef and then come the vegetables. So again, my point, the nutrient dense foods are the animal based foods. And you can certainly get them from other foods but you have to eat a whole lot more of those vegetables in order to get the same amount of nutrients from animal produce. Her conclusion, and again, she's not a medical doctor, I'm not claiming that at all, but it con this is my what I presented earlier, and it's, she confirms what I was saying. I have concluded that weaning infants onto an animal-based diet best meets their nutritional needs. Why? Unique properties resulting from the evolution of our brains, and we'll go on to that because our brains go so rapidly in the first two years of life, that the only source of food that can provide all the nutrients we need for our growing brains are animal or fish-based diets. Evidence from modern studies, and then she also says that she gave some tips on weaning from her personal experience. And so, why human brains are unique? Our brains are exceptionally large relative to our body size. So primates like gorillas and chimpanzees have brains three times as large as most other animals, but humans <coughs> have brains three times as large as other primates. And this three times expansion evolved over a few million years. So we didn't just become big-brained over a few minutes, it took a long time. And key, unlike other animals, most of our brain growth happens after birth. And that is because the, the fetus must go through the birth canal, and the birth canal is restricted in its size. So we can't have a big brain. We have to develop the brain after we are born. And, and this is the key slide that, that I think we need to address. So on the left is the brain growth prior to birth, at birth, and then in blue is after birth, and then for the rest of time. And these are primates on the left. And what you see is there definitely is brain, brain growth after birth, but it's, it's minimal compared to what happens in humans. Because what happens in humans, you get this massive brain growth for up to two years, and it continues up to four years. But the most growth is between birth and two years. This massive increase in brain size. And for that to grow, you have to have lots of energy and lots of the new brain essential nutrients and what we really need to do is to show what happens if you eat little meat and lots of meat and lots of fish so ideally this might be an ideal curve but the argument would be is if you don't expose children to the proper amounts of brain specific nutrients the curve's going to go like this and the consequences are going to be dire because these children with these smaller brains we know are not going to have the intellectual capacity to children who have developed in this way. And that's the whole basis of the argument, why nutrient-dense foods are so important in the first two years of life. And the nutrient-dense food are animal and fish-based. They aren't cereals and grains. And that is crucial to understand. And I hope that that really makes the point. Here she lists four co-adaptations. So the brain's getting bigger, but to get it bigger, there had to be four other changes in human metabolism, biochemistry, to achieve that. Firstly, you had to have a high-quality diet, and that was high in animal foods. 
And so the argument is that humans are human because we learn to slaughter animals, and that was the key component. Then our brains could get bigger. As our brains got bigger and we're eating nutrient-dense food, we could have small intestines because we don't need these big intestines to, to ferment cellulose. So that, and incidentally, when you ferment cellulose, we turn it into saturated fat anyway, which is, of course, interesting. And where do we get cellulose from, Professor? Cellulose would be animals like the, the chimpanzees from the, what they eat in their environment, the roots, the shoots, and, and some fruits. And then, really important, reliance on ketogenic metabolism. And, and she makes the point that what humans did was they, they co-opted the ketogenic response, which is normally to carbohydrate deprivation or starvation. And that was already in all animals. Animals have that response. But what made unique, humans unique was that we co-opted that to build the brains of the babies, which, which I hadn't realized, that it was a co-option of this what was already in the biology of the primates, the ketone metabolism that we then used to build the baby's brains. And why? Because ketones are such unique compounds. They are fats which are water-soluble. And so they can transport through the body easily and they can cross the placenta and they can get into the brain. They can cross the blood-brain barrier without any problems. And that is what makes them unique. They are powerful agents for energy metabolism and for building brains at the same time. And they're water soluble, and that's the key. So if we hadn't had ketones, we would never have got big brains. Which of course is perhaps contrary to the evidence that the, the, the that was raised uh, by the complainant. And then the fourth thing which I made a big story of was that increased body fat, particularly babies. And recall that humans are the only land-based mammals whose babies are born fat. And we weren't always born fat. Primates are not fat. They're born thin. And we convert that body fat through ketones to our brains. So, and then which, where would the best sources of all these foods? Is animals the only best or most bioavailable source for DHA, which one of the one of the fats used in the brain development. Vitamin D, iron, vitamin A, zinc. And then, of course, some plants interfere with absorption, utilization of iron, iodine, and zinc. The structural components, so that the brain is made up 60% of lipids, and 40% of these lipids are cholesterol, and vitamin A is more bioavailable in animal sources. Fatty acids don't cross the blood-brain barrier. Cholesterol doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So how do you develop a brain with all these lipids? You have to develop them from ketone bodies. Madam Chair, the text was omitted in the bundle, but the bundle will be uh, corrected, Madam Chair. Page 772, same problem, Madam Chair, but Professor Noakes will refer to it. So then Are you she making a note at the drum does? Indeed so, Madam, Thank you. Madam Chair. So, sorry. so the conclusion is that ketone bodies are far from being dangerous and harmful to the body, they are absolutely essential because the ketone bon bodies are directly usable as energy, unlike fatty acids. They use to create most of the fat and all the cholesterol in the brain, and they can easily and abundantly cross the blood-brain barrier. And then ketone bodies have other effects, which, which are not important, but they do have other additional beneficial effects. And so that their argument is that, or her argument is, using fat for energy and for substrates in the brain requires ketone bodies. It's not, it's not that they need, they're absolutely essential, they are crucial. So infants, as I showed in, in my testimony, are in mild ketosis all the time. The infant brain uses ketones three to four times more efficiently than adults, and even children up to at least 12 become ketogenic quickly and easily. And human adults become ketogenic more easily than other species and without starvation. So it's been in response to carbohydrate restriction, we get this ketogenic response as well. So, and this is the point, humans co-opted a trait that was previously an adaptation to cope with starvation into the default met metabolism to support brain growth in particular, but also to meet the brain's ongoing energy requirements. And that was a point I didn't make previously, that ketones are, we had the ability to use ketones for other things, 
but humans in our evolution co-opted ketones because of this incredible value they have to growing brains and at the same time providing the energy for the brain of the developing infant. And at the same time, we increased our body fat stores, and I've discussed that. They're not terribly, that's not important, but the point is we, we became fatter and we used that fat, subcutaneous fat, in the, the neonate to develop ketone bodies in the liver, which then are transferred to the brain to help develop the brain. And then we did present this evidence that weaning on to meat, there are clinical trials comparing the acute effects. Acute effects, I make that point there, the acute effects over months, not generation, years and generations. But if you weaned onto a fortified cereals or weaned onto meat, the weaning onto meat produced better outcomes, higher zinc status, adequate iron, increased head growth, perhaps higher intelligence, and better general growth with, growth with increased adiposity. And I did discover most of those papers in our original testimony. It's just to confirm again that weaning onto meat versus fortified cereals, the benefits go to the meat group. Now, Professor, the, uh, uh, when it comes to evidence, uh, scientific, uh, uh, when it comes to treatment of patients and evidence based medicine, in the area of uh, diet, are there any regulations that you know of that state that evidence-based medicine should be used in the uh, prescribing of diets? Thank you. And this is uh, the final two slides, so everyone can relax. So I went and looked at the HPCSA regulations for the com professional communication of scientifically-based nutrition knowledge. And I did it for, for two reasons. Uh, and the one was to work out what are the restrictions on what you can say publicly if you're a dietitian and when you can present information without examining the patient. But these were the guidelines, and these are the guidelines, Health Professions Act 56 of 1974, regulations defining the scope of the profession of dietetics. And if we go down, as we will, to 2B, the promotion, this is where I find it relevant to talking to the general public, which is what I do. I speak to the general public, as many dietitians do, outside their practices, they are advising patients and, and advising the general public. And it says that the promotion of community nutrition by, point two, the professional communication of scientifically based nutrition knowledge according to need to individuals and groups within the community in order to motivate them to maintain or change nutritional behaviors in order to improve quality of life and to pre prevent nutrition-related disease. So the evidence is that dietitians throughout South Africa have a legal requirement to give scientifically-based nutrition knowledge. And my argument would be is that I have presented the scientifically-based nutritional knowledge which is at the cutting edge, which is where we should be in South Africa. And I would argue that if an, a nutritionist or dietitian who's reg registered with the Health Professionals Council who continues to ignore the evidence that I have presented is not acting within the scope of the Health Professions Act 56 of 1974. And I would further raise the question, what really interests me is that the single person who laid the charge against me is not here today, and she was not here in February. And I have to ask the question, why does she have no interest in listening to the contrary evidence that proves her wrong? And I believe that she is acting outside the requirements of the Health Professions Act. Not that I'm making that claim or anything. I'm just saying that I think in the future, dietitians need to be held to a higher council. They have to be held to this. Is what you are teaching scientifically based nutrition knowledge that is at the cutting edge. And if I've achieved anything in this hearing, it is to give the evidence as I see it in its totality of what is scientifically based nutrition knowledge in, September, in October 2016. And if we are able to get the message out 
that what we are teaching at our medical schools and at our dietetic schools is not the cutting edge current scientifically based nutrition knowledge, then everything I've suffered will have been worth it. And all the money I spent on this trial will have been worth it. And that ultimately is why I'm here. And that's why I spent so many hours preparing all this information, which I know is, is taxing to all of us. But I did it because I want to say, there's the evidence. Let's go out and teach it to our medical students and our dietitians. Thank you, Madam Chair.